I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Hello, and welcome to Marketing Trends. This is producer Ben Wilson. This episode of Marketing Trends features an interview with Seth Farbman. Seth just stepped down in January after four years as the CMO of Spotify, and has also served as the global CMO of Gap and the president of Ogilvy Earth for Ogilvy & Mather. Currently, Seth is an executive in residence at Yale University within the School of Management, where he works with students, providing guidance and insights on marketing, technology, and culture. In this interview, Seth talks about his background, how to build a category, and how he helped to do so with Spotify, why marketers should aim to get fans rather than users, and much more. Enjoy. Marketing Trends is created by the team at Mission.org and sponsored by Salesforce Pardot, B2B marketing automation on the world's number one CRM. Are you ready to take your B2B marketing to new heights? With Pardot, marketers can find and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click the link in the show notes. Here is your host, Ian Faison. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And on the other line, special guest, Seth, how's it going? <laughs> it's going really well. How are you, Ian? Good. You know, I figure you're a special guest. You know, you've, uh, you've got a new job. You've got some new cool stuff going on. It feels special. Yeah, it does feel special. This is, um, this is a very fascinating, interesting time in my career and therefore in my life. As uh, some of you may know, I left Spotify at the end of the year after nearly four years. I'm the founding CMO there, helped take the company public. So much great experience to be had by all, but it's tiring. It's a lot of work. Yeah. So I decided to leave and take a year and explore what I was really passionate about, spend time with people without an expectation of a short-term outcome, and spend some time at Yale where I'm an executive fellow and surrounded by some of the smartest minds anywhere in the world, which definitely keeps me on my toes. So I kind of rest and recover by diving in deeply into things. So it's a very special time. And some days I don't want it ever to end. And then other days I'm, I'm ready to apply my, my new view on life to another team and another organization. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And you have spent a amazing career with stops at a lot of companies that people know Things like AT&T, Ogilvy, Gap, and obviously Spotify most recently. But how did you get started in marketing? Oh, purely by accident. I, um, I started my career as a journalist. I went to school for journalism, very passionate about uh, making really a positive impact on people's lives. And, you know, at my core, I still think of myself not as a marketer, but as a writer. And um, what I discovered along the way was uh, a few things. One, after seven years as a journalist, it was and is not much better, uh, a really, really difficult industry. So if you want to be successful as a journalist, you really have to give up quite a lot. Things like time, things like, uh, you know, a, a family that sees you, things like money. And uh, I realized that. Uh, after a while, it was such a, a broken industry with, without a clear business model other than to reduce the cost of creating quality journalism. I got frustrated. And I probably got too frustrated too soon, but I was in my 20s. And that's what happens when you're in 20s. And so I went through uh, sort of a short version of what I'm doing now uh, and really just started to spend some time thinking about what I should do next. And, you know, nothing immediately came to mind, to be honest. I find that it is a process, but I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who said, listen, you ought to really think about what you're, what you're good at, what your skills are, rather than what your, what your career title is, what your job description is. And I thought about that. And what I 
soon realized with a lot of help is what I had a somewhat unique ability to do is to kind of walk in stupid every day to go very deep and understand something very quickly, which is what yeah. you have to do when you're reporting. And then, and here's the tricky part, distill it down to the most salient points. Take something highly complex like trade and tariffs, as an example, randomly picked, and then be able to provide back to people the information that makes it useful to them. If you're not providing useful information in a way that they can take and own and apply, then you've kind of not done anything. And so I started to think about what, where else I could apply those skills. And I thought about marketing. And, you know, I do think that uh, serendipity is your best friend in managing a career. And right at the time, as I was going through all of this, I got approached by a marketing director at a company called GTE. And uh, if you're not Generation X like I am, you don't remember GTE perhaps, but GTE was one of the um, one of the old telephone companies um, that competed with the monopolies after AT and T was broken up many, many, many years ago, and had really gotten into you know early days of building a wireless network, a cellular network, and they had sort of made a lot of investments in community with press and having reporters telling their story in some marketing, mostly B2B marketing, but they really didn't understand even what their own narrative was. You didn't have to work that hard when you were one of two in a, you know, in a highly regulated yet very profitable business like, like cell phones were. And so the, the, the marketing director asked me just to come in and give my thoughts on, on the brand and on the products and the way that the company fit into the community. And I didn't even know that was a thing at the time, but pretty quickly I, I got interested and through a relationship that uh, began with a, a simple outreach, I ended up taking a marketing manager job at GTE. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of serendipity. A lot of times I think people in their careers feel like it's luck, but I like that you said serendipity because you have to be ready for the moment when it comes, like you have to be ready for the knock when it comes. And I think a lot of people, you know, confuse those two things. Well, like they got lucky that, you know, that, that thing kind of fell in their lap, but you have to be in kind of the right mindset to take it. We had a guest on that said that she never worked in a job in her whole career that she was qualified for, but she was always ready for the next challenge. Um, and I think that, you know, being open and honest with yourself and figuring out you know, the way that you want to do something is super critical. Did you feel like, did you ever get any of that imposter syndrome early on? Like, I am not qualified to be here? I still have it every day. I mean, I really resonate with what you just said. It really resonates rather with me. You know, for, for many, many years, I thought I had a, a series of, 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 of lucky moments of good fortune. And then I started to realize that the pattern couldn't, couldn't be that good, right? And, yeah. you know, somebody said something in the middle of my career to me when they were giving me a promotion that I wasn't really sure was, you know, I was being promoted into a job I could do. And he said to me, it was Bill Gray, who for many years was the president of Ogilvy & Mather. And I had no experience in advertising. And he thought it would be a good idea if I came and, and tried it out mid-career. And he said, you know, good things happen when you're around. I thought, wow, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe it is right place, right time, but then it's what you do with it. And it's just fascinating to me that every time I've taken on a larger role, a different role, a different industry, uh, talked about a different topic, the first time I do almost anything, I, I do feel like the imposter. I do feel like I'm unqualified assume that there's some sort of code that everyone else has that I just don't. That sort of ongoing insecurity, if you will, I think is actually the, you know, the coal that fuels, you know, the fire in a sense. It's, uh, it makes you, it makes you try harder. It makes you focus more. It makes you learn faster. 
And it also allows you, if you're very, very careful not to lose your stupidity. I found that in journalism and marketing, so helpful because you don't come in with preconceived notions. You, you don't just assume it's always been this way and it always should be because you don't know it's always been that way. So it's cool. maybe the secret sauce. Yeah, I mean, and what's so interesting in your career too is that you have worked with established companies that have been around for years that are like market leaders with huge histories and, and histories of innovation. And then also switching to new companies that have a brand new market that nobody knows about. And I kind of think that that, whether you call it a beginner's mindset or, or whatever, however you view it, it's really hard to go into a role like you went into Spotify. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But if you don't have a beginner's mindset, because what Spotify was doing is something that no one in history had ever done. So, you know, all of the experience can't get you to a point where, you know, nobody had ever been the CMO of of Spotify, but also, you know, at that moment in time, nobody had ever kind of pushed the limits of, of what we thought possible with all things music. Did you feel like, you know, when you were at the AT&T's, Ogilvy and Mather, the, the gaps that you had like a weight of responsibility to usher in, you know, a new generation of change or influence or something in those times because those companies were so established? Yeah, absolutely. But it's also, you know, it's not accidental. I, I chose roles and I'm very, very careful about what I choose. I choose roles that are going through transition, whether it's a turnaround like Gap, whether it's rapid scaling and crossing the chasm uh, like Spotify. I choose roles where it requires innovation, original thought, rather than simply execution. And I choose them because that's what interests me. You know, another little piece of learning that I got uh, many years ago and I share often is, you know, we have this concept of work and work by its very nature, by its name, in fact, we expect to be hard. And it is, but you have to pay attention to the parts of work that are easy for you. The parts of work that seem to come so naturally. The parts of work where you have intuition, you don't know where it comes from, you have to prove it. You need the information and data to prove your intuition, but you just have that instinct. And if you pay attention very carefully to your own, you know, it's your mind, but it's more than anything, it's the way you feel, like the way you're, are you energetic? You know, does it excite you? And focus on those things, you're going to do better in your career. So I try to look for opportunities that both, met my interests, of course, but also needed the thing I was good at. And I think a lot of times, especially as you're trying to move up in a career, trying to get to that you know, CMO seat or whatever your ambition is, we, we think we should do whatever. And all experience is great experience, so there's no wrong answer there, but it's about climbing, it's about overcoming. When I... I I think a bit of introspection and really thinking how you can be in service with what it is that you're best at is the way to grow a career. So if you look at mine, right, I've been in a bunch of different industries at different stages, as you mentioned, but there was commonality there. The commonality was a need for transformation. And, you know, I think good CMOs become great CMOs when you lead a company through a transformation and it's damn exciting too. Yeah. What was that thing that you were good at? that you saw that these companies needed that you could, you could provide? You know, I can articulate it now. I couldn't at the time, but I, I find that that companies either lose sight of why they even exist or they just haven't found it yet, which was the case perhaps in newer companies like Spotify or Ogilvy Earth, a, a company that I started with Ogilvy and Mather. And, and I think that the ability to create a larger narrative, a narrative for the company that goes beyond the products and services it sells, that inspires others within the company, paints a a picture for the near future 
which is so important for customers to feel like they're part of something that's that's growing, has momentum, is the next big thing, is interesting, is so important. And 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 I do think it's a bit of an instinct. I I'm very fortunate that I I kind of see things a little bit earlier than a lot of people. And then what I think I'm good at is kind of <laughs> sounds funny, but enrolling them in a vision. Because I believe you have to enroll people in a vision. It just makes the work and the business easier and uh, and more enjoyable. I want to talk about that specifically with regards to Gap. So were you in charge of all brands at Gap? No, I influenced all brands for sure. But when I joined, there was a very serious, like a dire need to turn around the namesake, the Gap brand. And even though the Gap brand maybe wasn't contributing all the revenue, it it really affected all the brands and it affected all the stakeholders. I always found it so interesting. We'd go on our, you know, our monthly sales calls or our quarterly calls with the street and they were not interested in the other brands. They were really only interested in what was happening with Gap as Gap That's went wild. and did the rest. Really? That's really interesting. And it sort of proves the point that no matter what the numbers say, a a huge way of evaluating anything is through an emotional connection. And so uh, Glenn Murphy, who brought me in during a turnaround, the, the whole management team had been let go. Glenn had been there a couple of years. He'd done a fantastic job, you know, and really like solidifying the operations of the company, um, but really couldn't get past the, the decay. There was a, a statement he used to say, that Gap was the share donor. And we just couldn't figure out how to, they couldn't, I guess, how to grow. And so, you know, you do what you have to do and you, you change people when you've tried a lot of other things. And he brought me in and it was really all about revitalizing what I considered an iconic brand. And I, I didn't have a, <laughs> to be honest, I, I didn't love the apparel industry uh, or fashion, although it was interesting to me, but you know, this was a brand that I grew up with, you know, in the nineties, I worked, I worked at a Gap store to, you know, pay for graduate school. And, uh, my sister worked at Gap as a district manager and some of the, some of the best marketing and Gap has always been a marketing led company came from Gap and yeah. Gap helped identify artists and, you know, working with run DMC sort of brought uh, hip hop to a, a larger, a larger group of fans. There was just so much influence, and I just had a love for the brand. And I, quite honestly, I just thought it deserved better. And so I, I went that. deep on Gap, and it did have, I think, a, a broader effect on all the brands. Um, but <laughs> we still had some portfolio management issues that I, I think were were quite difficult, that created some constant headwinds. But we overcame them. Uh, at least with some level of clarity on what the Gap brand really stood for. Well, so I, this is completely an aside, but so I did a study back in like 2007 on Gap and Gap's brands and all this sort of stuff. And basically this, it was like a, essentially it was like a case study about how Gap basically like ruined all of the momentum that it made in the nineties and, you know, like store closures and all this sort of stuff. But what was so interesting, this is like pre, you know, obviously you first off, <laughs> but uh, it was pre e-commerce for brands really taking off in a way that's like meaningful. And it was all about stores. It was kind of like the same thing that you were just saying, where it was like, you know, so goes the Gap brand, so goes the rest of the brands to the to the investors. But it's kind of the same thing in this case study. It was like, well, so goes the stores, so goes the brand. Like here, here lies this, it's this obituary, right? Here, here lies this dominant brand. And I, same thing, like I grew up in Oakland across the street from, you know, San Francisco. Gap was a huge part of, you know, the Bay Area in the 90s. And I kind of like was kind of the same sort of thing looking at this. I'm like, this is crazy. There's a gap on my street. There was a baby gap on the street that I grew up on. And so there are gap kids, I think, or maybe it was baby gap, but yeah, it was just this kind of thing where it was like, everyone was saying kind of this one thing, which is 
like stores are closing left and right, blah, 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 blah. And then you usher in a new digital age in which shoppers are now empowered like they've never been empowered before. You can leverage in-store and out-of-store. You can leverage email lists and, and flash sales and all these things. Was that something that when you came in in you know, circa 2011 that you were like, we can have a digital strategy and a brand strategy and put all this stuff together to make something really impactful for the customer? Yeah, hundred percent. And it was, uh, it was not easy. One of the things that you know I learned, you know, very painfully, is how legacy systems really can slow innovation. Yes. And when you're when you're in the retail business, very tough business, and have been contracting for some time, it's also hard to convince the board to put that much money into uh, you know an entirely new platform so that your data is all in one place and you're easily able to access it. And so there was a lot of technology issues that I don't believe were ever solved. So we had to create a workaround, but digital was absolutely at the center. You know, when I joined, the role of social media for Gap was to put the 30% off discounts out into the world. Jeez. Yeah. And um, no one could figure out why it wasn't working, but they still did it anyway. And um, in the early days, I, you know, I was, I, I did some things that were intentionally disruptive and controversial. When I joined, it was right around the time of the Arab Spring. And uh, it was, uh, you know, a, a quite a disruptive time around the world, but it was also strangely hopeful as well. There was a little bit of optimism. And Gap to me had always been quite an optimistic brand. And there was this image of, you know, some of the protesters, I think it was probably in Egypt, and one of them had arms raised above his head, clearly showing the Gap sweatshirt. And I thought, this is symbolic. This is, this is what we all need to remember, mostly in the company, is no matter what our ills may, may be, that this brand still symbolizes an incoming generation. It still symbolizes change like it did in 1969 when it made denim uh, the uniform of baby boomers, essentially. And so I got some of those images and got them cleared and I shared them on social media. And, you know, that probably sounds not so controversial today, but going back a decade or whatever it was, you know, that was, that was making a statement. And was it a political statement? Were we picking sides? What was our view of Arab Spring? No. It was simply that when there is change in the world and when there are people who are, who are asserting their individuality, their humanity, if you will, Gap continues to, to be the uniform of choice. You know, there were calls to pull it down. It was a whole emergency thing. But the great thing was, you know, in 12, 24 hours, we survived, you know, that radical idea. And then it gave confidence that we were, in fact, dealing with a, a channel of two-way communications. And that allowed us to really shift to a, a social strategy. The second thing that we did really quickly was I hired a, a woman named Rachel Tipograph. She founded a company called Micmac. She did not allow me in on the friends and family round, which I love. <laughs> but she was 23 years old. I hired her to be the director of digital and social. It kind of shook things up, as you might imagine. But my view was, you know, she started her first company at 16. She had grown up in a digital environment. She understood social sort of in her bones. And let's just let it rip. Let's just see what happens. And one of the things that we developed was a program called Styled By. And it essentially suggested that the way that people bought or chose fashion was maybe antiquated. We looked mm -hmm. at, you know, very glossy images of people that don't really even seem real in environments that we'll never go to. And yes, there's some inspiration in that for sure. But what we did is we, we looked for, you know, what we'd call influencers today, but we really just looked for some creative people who seem to have a following on the web and, you know, things like Tumblr, pre-Insta, right? 
Mm-hmm. And we ask them to style through through their aesthetic lens and choose the the people that they thought best represented their audience, if you will. And we made it shoppable. So now you had your first level of curation, collaboration, and it took the brand from being um, sort of an old school monolithic you know, unidirectional messaging brand to one that seems okay with imperfection, okay with opening itself up and allowing others to interpret. And we saw then, and all that Styled By did was essentially was not directly shoppable like it is now all the time, but it just referred, you know, that product to the website. Occasionally we got it right, but sometimes we didn't. We'd just drop you on a landing page and hope for the best. But we could see that that referral had a much, much higher, you know, purchase rate and that customer was a much higher value customer uh, coming back four and five times a year instead of the two and three that we were seeing. Um, And it really indicated that that digital in those early stages was perhaps the way that we could dig ourselves out of this, this hole that was created by opening a store in every damn mall in America. Did you take that information back to the leadership team? Did you take it back to the board and show them like, hey, we we might want to start thinking about stuff differently? Or was that kind of one of those things where you ran the experiment, you had the data, and now you needed to say, okay, I need to double double down on this in private and then just show them the results? Or like what was the what was the next step there? Yeah, I didn't um I didn't take the concept to the board for approval. I certainly shared it with them and its success. And I would have shared it even if the success hadn't been as, you know, as strong, but it it was very interesting. My first board meeting, I really understood the power of desperation because a lot of things had been tried at Gap and it just had not really stuck. Mm -hmm. And um, my first board meeting, and, you know, I had such great support from Glenn. I, I really believe that you know, much of the success that I had there, that we had there really was because he, he just believed that we would get there and he was willing to take a bet on things. So it starts there. But the conversation with the board went something like this. What do you think the average age of our customer is? They looked at each other, hoping someone would answer first. And I said, it's 39 years old. Okay. 39 years old. Okay. It's a data point, single data point. And then I said, listen, at 39 years old, the only thing I'm certain of is that next year, the average age is going to be 40. (laughs) The other thing, though, that I'm pretty certain of is if your core customer is 39 or 40 years old, your core customer is not interested in discovering new styles and new fashions, is likely not interested in exploring more digitally is likely not your best representation when they're wearing your product. This is an environment where youth, the incoming generation always has and likely always will be the real driver of relevance because that's a driver of culture, especially in the US and Western culture. And so I said, what if we do this? What if we take all of the marketing money that we're spending on our core customer, which makes sense, right? These people love you. They're, they're spending money with you. You want to focus on them. What if we take it and we put it all towards millennials, you know, 24, 25-year-olds who had maybe some fondness towards Gap, especially through the kids and baby sub-brands when they were growing up, but we're not shoppers. And I got sort of the quizzical look and they said, well, doesn't that mean we go out of business? And I thought, you know, if, if the 39 or 40 year old hasn't left us yet, in spite of our, you know, of every effort to destroy our relationship with our customers, <laughs> if they haven't left us yet, they're probably not going to. It's probably a solid LTV customer. And at the time, there were no other answers, right? They had seen other people who come in before me and probably had other ideas of better photography or more sweaters or whatever it is. (laughs) But this was really just about going back to what made Gap Gap twice before with the boomers in 1969 when 
you know, a husband and wife, never before in the apparel business, thought, hmm, let's give it a shot and created a, a, a single store called Pants and Discs Records. Um, they got rid of the records because they kept getting stolen, but they kept the pants. Yeah. And, and then again, in the late 80s and 90s, with, with Generation X, with my generation, where again, they captured this sense of individuality. Sharon Stone in the white t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was something that the, the next generation really leaned into and understood that being truly yourself means that you wear the clothes, the clothes don't wear you. And just had missed this opportunity with millennials, just missed it, missed it by six or seven years, but it wasn't too late. And so going back to the beginning and then applying it to the future, if you will, really ended up being kind of the marching orders and gave us confidence to, to move ahead swiftly. And it takes a while because you have to start with a product. You always have to start with a product. So it took us about a year. A woman named Pam Wallach, who was running the design group and also the merchandising group at the time, you know, she and I just held hands with this and we said, it's going to suck for a year, but we're going to make sure the right product for the right, you know, audience, right customers, the ones that we're really trying to attract was, you know, we needed to get that in every store. We had to feel good about it because... We did not want to invest in, in marketing until we knew that we had the product to support it. So it took so, a year, but then it went through the roof. And I want to get into the through the roof part, but I, I wanted to interject really quick with another thing that's so interesting about these life points and like millennials specifically like back then, because you're, you know, you're talking, this is like eight years ago, what were millennials going through right now? They were getting their first jobs. It had just come out of the recession, right? So you're talking about like a couple years outside of the recession. They're finally getting jobs. They have to go to work and be professional. They have to go out and, you know, they're, you know, people are young and dating and going to clubs and bars and wherever it is, pumpkin patches, wherever people meet. And I think that there's this idea sometimes that we forget that when you're in that purchasing window, when you're in that window to like find your new style, you're kind of like open and vulnerable and like ready to explore stuff. And you're pretty easily swayed by marketing. It's a time in your life where like you don't know, you know, there's the people at the cutting edge who are looking for trends. There's kind of the middle group that's going to follow those trends. And then there's, you know, the late, late adopters or whatever they're called. But I think that it's, it's just one of those things that's so funny when you had that conversation with the board where all of my, my colleagues that are in, you know, the target demo, the earlier demo, you know your size, more or less. Hopefully your size doesn't get much bigger. You know kind of what you're looking for. You're ready to just buy the same item of clothing because you know that it fits and looks good on your body and, and whatever. So you're kind of in that in that mode a lot of times unless you're like, you know, super fashion forward. And maybe you have a few kids running around or whatever it is. So ultimately, you know, they might get thrown up on or dirty anyways. But I think it's just such an interesting thing to look at like, hey, you know, young people are looking they're actually looking for a way to differentiate themselves. And if you meet them more than halfway on that, if you add things like celebrities, if you add, or, you know, influencers, you can more than meet them halfway on this sort of thing, but it has to be a lot of work. And I just think it's funny that sometimes we forget what it's like to be in that moment at whatever age it is and to empathize with the person who's trying to stand out and be different and you know ha might have a little bit of extra money for the first time and wants to look better than they have before. Like fashion specifically is so that way. I mean, how much, how much prep did you all do like talking to customers and things like that? You know, we, we probably didn't do enough prep talking to customers because, well, I mean, the assumption was that the customers wanted something that we already had and not yeah. where we wanted to go. You know, and that kind of reinforcement of data is how you get stuck sometimes. So what we did is we talked to, to people who weren't customers and we looked at it much more broadly. You know, what you said is so true and what we end up doing is it's just the nature of human beings. But we look at things as if they're in isolation. So the number of, of insights companies, you know, had had millennial decks and were giving you the secrets to the millennials. And it drives me crazy. I, I hate the term. I hate the term. I, quick thing on this. 
it's like when you turn 24, you're not all of a sudden like, hey, I'm going to completely change my life. It's like when you get your first job or you graduate college or you get your second job or whatever it is or your first salary job or whatever, those are milestones. Those are huge gates in your life. It's not because you self-identify as a freaking millennial. It drives me crazy. Exactly. Anyway. And those life stages, this is going to be sort of a, you know, more of a Western first world statement, but those yeah. life stages are, are very consistent. The context may be different, but when, you know, when, when my parents came of age, when Xers came of age, when millennials came of age, when our young son will come of age, those stages don't really change because those are stages in self-exploration and they're not, mm -hmm. they're not unique by industry either. So you look at fashion and I'm always interested in businesses that have a direct connection with culture. And, and at its core, what fashion is, is, is self-expression. It is, it is identifying who you are and sending those signals to the world. And we would all love to be the kind of person who is bold and brave and, and does that with great confidence. We're not. So some of us are. I'm not. But the rest of us then really need some curation and some reassurance and some comfort maybe pull it back a little bit, but that doesn't mean that the rest of us aren't interested in self-expression. It doesn't mean that the rest of us aren't interested in, in discovery. And that is to me really the key and also became the key to, to the strategy and the work and the attitude that we had at Spotify. It's about discovery and your, your, your best service that you can give to people in a highly complicated world. There's no, there's no shortage of information out there. It's not a lot of knowledge, but there's tons of information. <laughs> yeah. And so as, as a company, a brand, as a service, as a product, if you can help people all along a path of discovery, but still give them that joy when you found something that works for you and you want to share for others, now you're, you're doing what's right for for a customer, but you're also doing what's right for your company and your brand. And that is agnostic of, of age, of industry, of a service, whether it's a content type like music, whether it's fashion, what have you. That's what we do as human beings. And you have to look at what are the consistencies in the way that we think, the way that our brains work, the way that we learn, our fears, our hopes, the sort of, you know, innate humanness that's just built into our DNA. And then it gets a lot easier to figure out what to do and how to do it. And that's what I follow. People. Yeah. And you have this moment in time where you have, you know, increased share price 275% over four years at Gap. You are you know, seemingly on top of the world, you know, I don't know if internally you feel that way, but, you know, your name's, you know, one of the 50 most created people, one of the 10 most influential CMOs in the world, all this stuff. And you run into a little startup. Talk me through kind of how this, and like, and I want to keep that, you know, following people thread because I, and, and that's, I think it's a good segue to this of, you meet this this little startup and it seems like it is putting people first in a way for music that has never been done before. Yeah. Again, luck, serendipity, who knows? But it was absolutely the right thing at the right time. And I felt like Spotify, Spotify took all the skills that I had honed during a turnaround and uh, allowed me to apply them to a company that was at that inflection point of growth. Very similar in some ways, just a very different sort of a emotional state. It is really hard to convince people that this time we're going to turn around the company really hard. And there's a lot of proof that it won't be the last time. When you have something that is just sort of remarkable, at um, connecting with people and allowing people to enjoy and express and share like Spotify. But you have the simple issue of you've got to grow. You've got to make people understand what it is. 
And you've got to make people understand why they should trust a company they probably barely heard of from Sweden, no less, to really shift the way you consume music completely to create not a company or a category leader, but the very category itself. So I found those to be very sort of transferable. But look, I left Gap for really for two reasons. One is I felt like I had done what I came to do. And I find that that happens every four or five years. And when, for me, when my, when my learning curves tends to slow, I pay attention to that and I know it. But the second reason, and probably the most sort of direct, was that Glenn decided not to renew his contract as chairman and CEO. Mm -hmm. And so that was a very natural time. And honestly, I probably would have left a little bit earlier, but I just dreaded that call. Hey, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I left and it was, a, it was a really difficult time because it, this was happening in October, right before the big holiday season. There was some real concern about the two most visible people leaving at once. What would that say about what we thought our holiday would look like? Uh, so I, I agreed to stay on for about six months later. And it gave me a nice opportunity because, you know, once you decide to go, you should really just go because you're just, you know, dead man walking, right? You're just, you're just not really helping, even though you think yeah. you are. So. So, you know, I, I got the team all oriented and I sort of disappeared around holidays and, and never really came, came back in a sense. So it allowed me to have quite some time to really explore what I wanted to do next. And I looked at a bunch of things, but I kept coming back to Spotify. And of, of all of the conversations I was having, Spotify was the most opaque. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the one that everybody kind of like, they, they would furrow their brow, or they would say, I'm sorry, you're thinking of what? But it was the one I couldn't get out of my head. And, you know, fast moving company in some ways, very slow in deciding what it needed in its first CMO. And so these conversations went on for three or four months. And I knew some people who had already worked or who I'd worked with in the past who were at Spotify. So I got kind of the, the real story as well. But what I just realized was a, a few things. One is, you know, following your joy, some of the work that we did at, at Gap with musicians was always my favorite work. And just the connection that you could have with people uh, through music was always just remarkable to me. So, and I've always loved music. So it was, it was a, a, a category, if you will, that I was very interested in. People there that I knew and really respected uh, had been a customer for a few years through, uh, you know, a friend of a of Daniels, actually, who had gotten me in, you know, an er early access before it even launched in the U.S., Daniel Eck, the founder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just engaged and I had all these conversations with Daniel and, you know, Daniel's a self, you know, identified introvert. So at first, I didn't know how things were going, but we finally got to this one moment where he was talking about the founding of Spotify and what he was thinking about. And I was really amazed by how his mind worked, very contrarian. And I said, you know, I don't know how to do that. And he said, yeah. He's like, I don't know how to do what you do. And we looked at each other and we just thought, okay, maybe we'll do it. <laughs> but the thing that really surprised me about Daniel uh, was he recognized that Spotify was not just another tech company. Yep. And coming from Sweden, almost accidentally building this, this brand that was loved by people, it would constantly shock him when he would travel and people come up to him. And he had built other companies that were larger than Spotify, much larger. But he never experienced people coming up and just like saying, thank you so much. You know, I love Spotify. And then talking at great lengths about a feature or an artist or like really exhibiting that passion that so many brands want, but don't get from the product. So he instinctively understood that one of the most valuable things was this emotional and maybe irrational love that people had, this sense of magic and that sense of joy that comes from that magic. But He's a, a very much, a, you know, a, a left brain thinker. So how to, how to create process out of that, how to create strategy out of that, how to scale that was not something obviously that he was 
that he was focused on doing. It just wasn't his thing. And so it seemed to me like it was an incredible opportunity to not just build a, an audience base, not just drive growth and revenue through subscription, but to really define what the category was. And at the time, it was access. It was all about access. It was all the world's music for the price of a single album. Really nice value proposition, but it was essentially... You don't need your collection that you spent all of your life creating, making, no matter what format it was on, digital downloads, vinyl, CDs, whatever. You don't need all of that. All the world's music is in one place with a search bar. What else do you need, right? But, and again, you you have to remember this is before Apple Music, before Amazon, Mm -hmm. before everyone else got into the game. So we had competitors like, you know, RDO and Deezer. And... And what really interested me so much was the ability to define the category itself. And we were at a place where we still had to create trust. If you've gone through 14 formats on which to listen to music, you know, going to a 15th is, is a little tough. Or really, I got to learn something else. I still got, you know, I still got CDs in the back of my car that I never yep. used, right? And so you, you had to educate people. Like you really had to, to make sure that you held their hand through yet another transformation caused by technology, but at the same time, more deeply understand the relationship that people had with music. And my experience at Gap helped me kind of understand that that's where where the gold was, just sitting there on the floor, waiting to be picked up, is to really deeply explore the very personal, very emotional, very rich, relationship that people had with with music and spotify had all of the information all of the data it just had not been considered valuable when it came to marketing it was valuable when it came to recommendations but man people were just telling us they were just giving us the keys to the kingdom they're just telling us where their passion came from and what excited them and what didn't and it it was just too good an opportunity to build something from scratch, to pass by. And whatever the risks were, they were worth it. And it turned out pretty well. And I want to get into a bunch of this, unpack a bunch of the stuff you said about music and specifically, like, I want, I want to tie that into storytelling and some of the ways that you use data. But so how did you, what, what was the size of the company when you joined? What was the like, you know, user base? What was kind of the problem set as you took the role? Did you report directly to, to Daniel and, and kind of what was, what was like, you know, first 90 days for you? Uh, yeah, I reported to Daniel. We had, uh, you know, we have a, a lead team, you know, more of the European style. You know, it, it was and is, and I think always will be a sort of, product first, tech first environment. The size of the company, I think it was soon after I got there, I think we announced uh, around 70 million total customers, maybe, I don't know, 25 or so paid subscribers, the rest on the ad supported model, something like that. So it was still large, but it, it really hadn't become the, the 800 pound gorilla, I suppose, that, uh, that it later did. And, you know, Daniel's style is he's hands off. He wants to help. He wants to know how, how you're thinking about things, but he, he, he kind of lets you do your thing. And I think that that was really important and critical to be able to both build a team that was required and, and also do the kind of work that was not intuitive. As you know, most tech companies will They'll focus on growth, they'll focus on performance marketing, maybe some product marketing and call it a day. But we, we decided to really look at our assets differently. And my first 90, 100 days, whatever it was, was it was really to get to, to that understanding of our place in the ecosystem, of what we believed in. Mm-hmm. And um, at the time, soon after I joined Tidal, had just launched. And I don't know if you remember, but it was not a good launch. Oh, no, I remember. I distinctly remember. (laughs) And I just thought, how incredibly interesting. And what it allowed me to do is mentally say, okay, so title just said, we're for artists. And I thought, okay, I understand why you're going that direction, but it, it, it just, 
felt like a lead balloon to essentially create a company so that artists can get paid more money, right? Especially artists that were already making a lot of money. And there were issues there for sure, but it just fell down. And then Apple was, you know, right there in the near horizon. And I thought, and you know, and I'm a, I'm a huge Apple brand fan. I, I, you know, I've been using the products forever. I can't say, you know, enough about how much I respect the company. And yet, you know, Apple's always been about Apple and they create this environment and they welcome you into it. And it is beautiful, but it's their environment. And if you want it, it's here. If it's not for you, so be it. And I, I love that. But it started, I started to realize that, you know, there was a place here for Spotify and, you know, we weren't artists for artists. You know, Apple's always been for Apple by Apple. Mm -hmm. It could be for fans by fans. And so I, I spent my first 90 days really understanding what it meant to be, you know, for fans. And, you know, there were little things that being fairly new to tech, I just didn't understand, like why we insisted on calling our audience or our customers or our fans users. Oh man, totally agree. Right? I mean, you just depersonalize. It feels like it's, you're, you're there to leverage value, to get value from them. And like, you just change names, like call them fans. And suddenly you want to be closer to them. You understand them better. You, you want to fulfill their fandom. Yes, yeah, Sean, Sean Shepard always says, uh, he's like, there's only two people that call people users, drug dealers and techies. <laughs> And it's, I mean, it's true. It's, it's, I mean, it is, I, I absolutely hate the term. I can't stand it. I, I kind of, to be honest, I kind of feel the same way about brand and we talk a lot about brand. I'm like, and I totally get it, but it's like brand is a company. Like I get, I, I feel like there's another name, but I digress anyways. No, I agree with that too. I, I always remind people that, you know, brand is not a logo. It's not the name of the company. It's nothing marketing owns. Brand is simply an aggregation of everything you do and you say and you make and it essentially is is the, the the trust you either have or don't wrapped up into one thing, but it's um it's it's a bad word. I mean, one of the problems with marketing, as we well know, is we have a lot of buzzwords that even we don't understand. <laughs> yeah, totally. But I love the fans. That I mean, that's brilliant. We might we might need to start using that. We say audience and customers at Mission, but yeah, I, I like I like fans. Audience is just tough, and then we use community. That's the other one because we have a community of listeners and like they provide feedback and email us and do all sorts of cool stuff. So we're here to serve them. So, and since we're doing an aside, I've started thinking more recently that more and more large companies are, they're more like governments. And I mean, you look at Facebook, there is no country, there is no government bigger, right? Yeah, totally. So, so I, I've started to think about the role of companies to be in service of its citizens. So the customers are citizens and the, the company itself is is government, not not government, unfortunately, how it usually is, but how it ought to be setting rules and creating opportunities and a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of safety, all of these things for its citizens. Not exactly the right words, but at least it puts me in a more, I don't know, just a just a more optimistic frame of mind when I employ that. Yeah, it's it's a thought experiment that I think every company needs to do, right? Is is that exact thing of like what if we change the names? Like what if, you know, what if we what if we called people different things? How would we think about them? What what if we, you know, called ourselves something different and reimagined it? No, I, I think that's I think that's really sharp. So so at Spotify I felt like for fans by fans. At first I thought that was a positioning exercise. And the more I thought about it, and I thought, no, it's not that it's a positioning exercise, but what it, what it really did is it drew kind of our attention to what our most valuable resource at the time was because the music is fairly undifferentiated. We all had the same catalog, more or less. And, and that was this fan base, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and Spotify's fan base, and I can take no credit for this, like the, you know, those first five or six years, it, it was the audience you want. It was the lean-in fans. It was, the, it was my friend's older brother who got me into all that, you know, the classic rock that I still listen to today, right? The, the, the guy who told me Jim Morrison's story and mm -hmm. um, introduced me to The Who and, you know, music that, you know, was a little before my time, but that was the Spotify audience. It was like that person. 
the human centric tastemakers. I mean, that's what for me, when my buddy Christian would share, he was the guy who always made all of the CDs for everyone who would burn everybody's CDs because he was the best at making mixes. So when he came up with light rock, less talk mix and shared it with people like that stuff, I mean, the fact that your friends could be friends and then ultimately non friends could be tastemakers is so brilliant and it's like we were all familiar with it because that's what we do with cds as soon as as soon as we could download and, and create them exactly so here we had you know whatever 70 million of these tastemakers lean in affecting culture reflecting culture you know if you're a fan of music you're probably a fan of of film and you're a fan of art and you're a fan of food and because it is about wanting to discover more and to be to be kind of like really part of life and connected and feeling, feeling, right? So that's a great audience. It's a great audience if you want, you know, to, to offer it up to other brands to put their products and services in front of, right? So as mm -hmm. an advertising model, it was great. We had fans that we could then make sure through the miracles of software, we could connect back to artists and it, it just helped me sort of clarify that it was not so much access to music, it was this inherently powerful act of discovery. And what I believed at the time and still do today, Spotify did better than anyone else, was provide that discovery. And if you think about the role of software, the role of software is simply to, to accelerate. So there's no way I can find from 70 million people at the time what, what music I should listen to by pulling them one by one. But through the algorithms, we were able to not just give people what they liked, but to understand what they liked in common with what 10, 15, 20 million other people liked and deliver the difference, not the thing that was the same. So if all these other people also liked Green Day, then you could probably introduce to that fan another band that those other Green Day fans really like, but that you just haven't discovered yet. So you have this sense all of a sudden that new music, new artists are delivered to you in a way that must be magic because even though you've never heard it before you just absolutely love it you love it when this this is the like elemental kind of piece the storytelling piece the how music you know affects you piece of this because you know humans we, we talk all the time humans have been telling stories for thousands and thousands of years they've been making music for thousands of years it resonates there's part of our brain that remembers this stuff way better when it's a story it, we remember you know these jingles and these things way better when it's music and it puts you in that exact kind of moment in time and when you have nostalgia for a certain song and a moment in time and the mix that was on at the party where you met your future husband, that stuff starts to compound in a way that like you don't ever want to leave the platform because this is, you know, this is part of your story. And you launched one of the most brilliant marketing campaigns. And I'd love to get into this where you were having, you know, billboards and all this stuff about to the 1,235 guys who loved Girls Night playlist this year, we love you. And, you know, dear person who played Sorry 42 times on Valentine's Day, what did you do? And all of that. I mean, it's just such a brilliant look at how people use the product. And we always talk on marketing trends about like always fight where you can win. What does your company provide that nobody else can, can do? And this was one of those things that only Spotify, only on Spotify, could you share these type of stories? And only on Spotify, could you go find these type of things? And it was tongue in cheek and it was funny and it was like elegantly done. So I'd love to, for you to unpack that, that campaign. Yeah, absolutely. There, there were, there were a couple of things that happened that were sort of the precursors to it. When I arrived, there had been for maybe a year, maybe two, I can't recall, uh, a very simple, really a CRM program called Year in Music. And the idea was that we're collecting the data, 
we ought to give it back to you in a beautifully designed, very shareable set of statistics that demonstrate sort of your connection and love of music. So we would say how many hours you listened. We would say what artist you helped discover. We would show you your, your best genre, you know, your favorite genre. We'd show you over the course of the year. You listen to tons of this kind of music in the spring, and then you change in the fall, and people would be like, oh, yeah, no, I remember that because I yeah, grew yeah. up with my significant other, and I was playing nothing but Adele or whatever it was. Yep. It was a very simple but very popular, almost like a gift at the holiday season. But, you know, and I loved it, but I just started asking a lot of questions because I felt like one of the things we needed to crack was that, you know, Spotify may have been 70 million people listening hours and hours a day to music, but they were doing it in isolation, usually with headphones, right? So how do you create this sense of belonging, of community, of fandom when you really don't have strong ways of, of sharing. And so the question that I asked is, what if we did a year of music for a country? What if we did a year of music for a group of people? Like, what if we build it from the individual back up, essentially, to culture? What would we find? All that the questioning did was change the kinds of things that we looked for and look for consistencies in listening patterns that would suggest that music and what people listened to reflected what was happening in culture and vice versa. And people often ask, well, you know, where do you start? How do you look at the data? Isn't it sort of unstructured? And it certainly was. But again, sometimes it's the simple things where what people name their playlists is an absolute clue. Yep. It's brilliant. It's such a good insight. <laughs> yeah. So we started this with a playlist campaign. And the one that you know it sticks in your head, and whether it was really the first one that I had the aha moment or I'm just remembering it that way, was someone said, well, there's this playlist. It's called Stuck in the Airport. I'm like, oh, that's, that's funny. It's 18 and a half hours long. <laughs> yeah. And immediately you get a mental image, you can relate to it, you have empathy, you sort of laugh, and you're also glad that's not you. But that one playlist brings almost everybody in. And so as we started to look at these playlists, it became really obvious that there were, um, that there were stories in there. And so the beginning of this idea was to simply do a playlist campaign. And then it expanded quite a bit when we got better at identifying that relationship with culture. And, you know, for the, the person in Shoreditch that played It's the End of the World as we know it, uh, 123 times in yeah. Brexit, hang in there. And that really became all of the marketing. We never talked about Spotify. We never talked about why we're better than somebody else. We didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. Our role was really to both identify and elevate and applaud the passion and the creativity that comes from when an artist and a fan get together around a piece of art. Yeah. I mean, it also informs, see, the other brilliant thing is like any, first of all, like any marketing that's actually funny is already a cut above, but it also informs the listener that there's, or the reader or the viewer or whatever it is, that there's stuff happening on the platform that they don't know about, that people are using it in a different way that they could find these things. Like that is so brilliant because you're like, you are opening a loop for them in a way that they can take action. They can go find that playlist. They can go, you know, and they've had those sort of moments. I, it really is one of the most brilliant campaigns. Well, thank you. I mean, we're, we're tremendously proud of it. And I think it's also a... It's also a good example for a lot of marketers who are struggling with narrative, storytelling, being inspiring, and at the same time having lots of data that can be helpful, but not really sure how to use it, where to mm -hmm. use it, what its role is. I like to remind people that it really, it doesn't have to be 
you know, some deep science that, re- that requires calculus. It really is about curiosity and then looking for all of the signals within your product or service and your customer base that, that, that tell those narratives. And what is, you know, what is an absolute truth is people are, they're so creative in and of themselves, right? Like we think of our artists certainly as creators. We call them that at times, but fans are as well. People are so creative. And if you, if you tap into sort of their creative passion, they become, you know, medium and message. Uh, and they do it willingly because you're in a conspiracy. You're in a conspiracy to be more interesting and to rid the world of boredom. boredom. And, you know, we could definitely use more of that. Okay, thanks for listening to part one of our interview with Seth Bardman. To hear part two, tune into Marketing Trends tomorrow. Thanks for listening to this episode of Marketing Trends. Marketing Trends is created by the team at mission.org and sponsored by Salesforce Pardot. World-class marketers use Pardot to generate and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI at every stage of the sales cycle. Empower your marketing team to become revenue-generating superheroes and let Pardot's data analysis keep an eye on the bottom line. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click on the link in the show notes.